My name is Liam Connery, and I am the president of the Stockton Psychology Club. My name is Roxanne Camfield, and I'm the vice president of the Psychology Club. We are pleased to introduce the recipient of the 2018 Distinguished Psychology Alumni Award, which recognizes the professional and service achievements of Stockton alumni who majored in psychology. This year, the recipient of the award is Sandra Mueller. Sandra Mueller, Stockton class of 1980, is the warden of the Ocean County Department of Corrections. With over 30 years of professional experience in rehabilitation services, counseling, and the administration in the Ocean County Department of Corrections, Warden Mueller oversees the county's 629-bed adult detention facility. After graduating from Stockton, Warden Mueller earned a master's degree in administration, administrative science from Fairleigh Dickinson University. She is also a certified jail manager and an adjunct professor, professor at Ocean County College and a New Jersey Police Training Commission certified instructor. Please join us in congratulating Warden Mueller. Hi folks, um, my name's Michael Frank. I'm a professor here and have been a professor here since the 70s. And that brings me to um, Sandra. Sandra was a student here in the 1970s. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about her that she maybe won't tell you herself. Um, we had a commune at the college in Absecon, uh, owned by uh, a retired faculty member. His name was Bill Sensaba. And Sandra lived in that commune. And she had a roommate uh, who also lived in the com room, uh, commune. Uh, this guy's name was Harvey Kesselman, who is currently president of the college. Um, so things kind of go around and come around all, all, t all together. Uh, she and I, she reminded me just this morning, I, was, I had forgotten about it. She and I did some research on biofeedback in the uh, 1970s. And um, I met her again because one of my students wanted to do an internship at uh, Sandra's jail. And so we spoke on the phone, and we weren't able to get together at the time. But the student came back and said, it was a wonderful internship. And it reminds me and reminded me of all the things that people can do with an undergraduate degree in psychology. Sandra, of course, is uh, a warden in Ocean County. She is, by the way, the first woman warden in New Jersey. Second, second, okay. Uh, I, there was somebody I didn't know about, obviously. <laughs> um, at, at any rate, um, uh, she is here to tell you about some of her experiences. Uh, and I now remember her from 35 years ago, a long time ago. Anyway, Sandra Miller. What a long route has, it has been, a long circuitous route from Stockton as a student to here again today, almost into the twilight of my career, contemplating retirement, coming full circle today to get this award. So I would like to thank everybody for this honor. And I'm very thankful to be able to return to Stockton and talk a little bit about its impact on my life my career, talk about the early years of Stockton, and to share with you some insight of how what I learned at Stockton impacted what I do for a living. I'm a warden, I work in corrections, I've been in corrections for 35 years. So by circuitous, I don't mean some long winding geographical journey because I've never really been in 40 years more than 40 miles away from Stockton. I'm referring to a journey of the mind, of life, learning, and changing times. 1976, my first semester at Stockton College, I was 25 years old. I was married, I had a small child. That small child is here today, my daughter Melanie. I was not a traditional student, but Stockton wasn't a traditional campus in 1976 not in terms of its faculty or its student body. 
The faculty, as I remember, was somewhat renegade. Um, and the student body was very diverse. There were older people, there were younger people, there were vets, there were law enforcement people going to Stockton. So I didn't feel out of place. This, in addition to the beauty of this campus in the Pine Barrens, which I still love and I still pretty much live in the Pine Barrens, drew me to Stockton, and the fact that they had daycare. They had free to be. I would not have been able to go back to college without free to be. So I was very thankful for that. Truth be told, I was a very mediocre student. I was a mediocre student in high school, and I was a mediocre student my first year of college right out of high school when I was 17 years old. I wasn't ready for college when I was 17, but Stockton was ready for me when I was 25 years old. As I look around, I'm kind of struck that most of you were probably not born when I started at Stockton. And I want to tell you a little bit about how so it was so different to be a student then, and I'll tell you a funny story. In preparation for today, when I found out I was getting this award, I decided I wanted to get my transcript because I couldn't find it. I wanted to look back and see what the classes were that I took. So I went on the website and registered and as an alumni and tried to get my transcript. Couldn't get it, had to connect with IT to help me get my transcript. They were very nice and helped. Nobody can find it. Finally, somebody figured out that I was, when I graduated, it was prior to electronic records that my transcript was a paper transcript in a drawer somewhere that somebody found and they mailed it to me. So it was a very different time to go to school. I might also add there was no such thing as word processing. The internet as we know it did not exist. Wikipedia, Google, cell phones, personal computers, all the things that are so important to education today didn't exist then. Um, I did do a lot of research for my professors. I did internships. I did research. And uh, research meant going to Philadelphia, going to Temple University, University of Pennsylvania, going to their libraries, using the Dewey Decimal System, looking up things, getting books, making copies, getting microfiche. Writing meant little pieces of paper with thoughts on them that I, I would tape to a wall and rearrange and reorder and then tape together at the end and then type it on a typewriter. So it was very different. And you're very lucky that you have the tools to make education such an amazing experience now. So I look at my transcript and I look at the courses that I took that I couldn't even remember a month ago. And it becomes clear to me where I was heading and how I ended up where I am. So I'm amazed at what I studied and what an impact it had on me. I have a very vivid memory of my first psychology class. Uh, intro to Psychology, Professor Lee Hoxter, sitting in his class and learning about the id, the ego, and the superego. Nothing new, not a new concept, but new to me. And it was so important, it had such an impact hearing it for, for the first time, because I was finding that what I was learning brought order to my perception of the world and people and behavior. And I knew right away from that first class that I wanted to be a psych major. Learning theory and research, reward and punishment, everything about corrections right there in a nutshell. Research method, methods, so important. So much of what we do in corrections is research-based. We have dollars that we get for programming for inmates to help change their behavior. We have to make sure that the, program we do, the programming we do is effective, so you have to measure the outcomes. So research methods was very important. Abnormal psychology and personality. It, was, it all played into where I went to. Uh, dance therapy, at one point, I really thought I wanted to be a dance therapist, so how far from what we think we want to do to where we end up. You need to be aware of that. Um, and of course, the big one for me, like Professor Brown, statistical methods. Let me expand on this a little and give credit where credit is due. 
I had a fear that I would never graduate because I had to take statistical methods. It was a black cloud that followed me everywhere academically. I was a very good student, but I was never good at math. I was never good at arithmetic. It was a huge stumbling block for me, academically and personally in terms of my confidence in my intellectual capability. I could write, I could comprehend, I could do research, I could memorize anything and ace any multiple choice test. But if it had to do with numbers, I hit a black wall. In my mind, in no way was I ever going to be able to pass statistical methods. Oh my God, it was math. It was hard. I was lousy at it. Fortunately for me, very similar to Dr. Brown's experience, my statistics professor, Mike Frank, who you met today, was an excellent teacher. He helped me, he encouraged me, he tutored me. He not only helped me learn statistics, I ended up loving statistics. I still love statistics. Learning statistics for me was like a light bulb going on in my brain. Some kind of exponential learning curve that I hurdled. And it was the biggest confidence booster for me. Not only did I learn statistical meth methods, the more important lesson that I learned was that I can learn anything if I put my mind to it and challenged myself. This lesson never left me, and it may be the most important lesson that I took from Stockton. I have never told myself since then that I couldn't do something, learn something, be something. My mantra in life became, I can do that. The barriers to accomplishment are mostly in our minds. To this day, I monitor myself. I catch myself telling myself that I can't do that. And I quickly change my mindset. And I say to myself, I can do that. Never let the voices in your mind tell you otherwise. I think that you will find in the future when you no longer remember the facts and figures and theories and models from your studies in college, that it will be the larger lessons that you will leave here, leave college with, that will serve you the most. How to challenge yourself. How to observe and analyze and process information. Stockton challenged me both in and out of the classroom. There were so many new movements that I was exposed to, new ideas for the first time in the late 70s. Feminism, politics, spirituality, the human potential movement. I remember the very first women's conference on the campus my first semester at Stockton and what a powerful experience it was for me. Women's studies groups, group experience, so many very vivid memories from Stockton, especially as I walk around here today. I was here a few weeks ago. Uh, the performing arts. I, was at also, I had a minor in dance. Um, the, my first semester on college was when they opened the performing arts center performing, dancing. Um, I was looking back at some newspapers, the Argo, looking at some of the extracurricular activities like the Ekinkar Society, yoga, um, Sufi dancing, so many things that I was exposed to for the first time that became part of my life. Racquetball, the sauna, the pool. Hey, what the heck happened to the pool? It's gone. <laughs> One of my most vivid memories, and it's not an academ academic memory, was back in the late 70s, we would have full moon feasts. We would dance around bo bonfires in blueberry fields, not far from here. I arrived on this campus as one person and left it completely changed. And that's probably the sign of an excellent education. So does anybody here want to be a warden? I didn't think so. I never thought of being a warden until about 15 years ago. Does anybody ha here have a clear idea where they want to be, what they want to do? Good. That, you are lucky. You are ahead of the curve. I think that probably most people don't, and that's OK, because I can tell you that I didn't know what I wanted to do for a long time. I didn't even want to graduate. I just wanted to stay in school forever. I love school. I love college. I didn't want to go out into the real world. 
especially when I realized that dance therapy probably wasn't going to pan out. All I knew was that I had to get a job. Everyone wants that job. I was obsessed with that job. Not just a job that supports you, but a job that fulfills you. Well, I would have settled for a job that supported me after a certain amount of time. I wasn't sure what that job was, and I wasn't having much luck, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. So like a lot of other people I knew who graduated, I ended up working in Atlantic City in the casino industry for about a year, and then as a construction worker, building casinos. Because I was very fit and I was very strong from all that racquetball and all that dancing, and I could <laughs> climb up and down elevator shafts. But then a series of events outside of my control completely brought that job to me because most of life is circumstances beyond our control, happenstance and serendipitous events. You know what they say about the best laid plans. So that job, after all that searching and anxiety, the job came to me, very little effort of my own. One of the Ocean County freeholders, that's the governing body of a, a county, knew I had a degree in psychology and told me there was a job available in the county jail and he wanted me to interview for that job. I wasn't thinking I wanted to work in a jail. It didn't sound like much fun. I was having a good time in Atlantic City, wearing a hard hat and climbing up and down elevator shafts. But the freeholder, who I thank to this day, I have a picture of him in my office, he's been dead for 20 years. He persisted, he insisted so much that I finally went to interview for the job that I really didn't want. So I went to that interview in that old jail, a horrible old jail. Quite a few people had gone before me for that interview, but apparently it wasn't for them. There's something about the sound of a metal door closing behind you, and it's actually always two metal doors that close behind you when you go into a jail. Um, that's Corrections 101. It's called a Sally Port. There's also something about the smell of a, of a jail and the sounds of a jail that is very off-putting to most people. Not me. I walked through those doors into your worst nightmare of a jail. I saw my first inmate that day. His name was Alex. He was chained naked to cells, cell doors in the booking area. Um, he was screaming. He was covered in feces. He was the first inmate I ever saw. He still comes to our jail after all these years, in and out of the jail. Fortunately, though, these days, we provide excellent mental health treatment in jails. Alex still screams, and he is still sometimes covered in feces, but we don't chain him to bars. We have rubber rooms. We have mental health. We have psychiatrists. We have social workers. We have medication. We stabilize Alex and he becomes manageable in a jail population. Perhaps it was my internship at Ancora that prepared me for the experience of being in a jail, but I wasn't scared away and I never said I can't do that. I did it. A little correctional background. In the late 60s and 70s, inmates began suing jails and prisons for the deplorable conditions of confinement that were occurring across the country. In 1978, the inmates of Ocean County Jail successfully sued the County of Ocean in federal court on conditions of confinement, specifically overcrowding, lack of fresh air, lack of social and rehabilitation programs, among other things. As a result of this, there was a federal court order, a consent decree that stipulated that the County of Ocean had to build a new jail with more bed space that Ocean County would have an inmate law library so that inmates would have access to the courts, that Ocean County would have indoor and outdoor recreation for inmates, and natural light in the housing areas. OC, Ocean County would develop programs for inmates, rehabilit rehabilitation and social programs, and Ocean County would hire an inmate counselor. Bingo, I became that inmate counselor. And another important socio-political trend that I have to mention 
besides inmate litiga litigation was the deinstitutionalization of the mentally ill in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, this is when we saw the long term, the closing of long term large state psychiatric hospitals that house the mentally ill, the developmentally disabled people that couldn't be managed at home in their communities. This deinstitutionalization, as it occurred, saw a massive exodus of these populations, hundreds of thousands of people across the country, to the communities who were ill-equipped, nor did they have the money to deal with treatment. And these people ended up homeless, and corrections picked up the burden of treatment for these people. So very many people coming into the jail are suffering from mental disorders and psychiatric disorders and developmental disabilities. So that's why I feel that my education here at Stockton is what helped put me there and helped me deal with that. Um, so these two diverging political forces, well, that's the, the framework of what was going on in Ocean County when I started there. So as I look as, at my transcript, I see how very clearly everything I studied at Stockton was very important to where I ended up. I graduated with a degree in psychology, but I ended up in criminal justice, which when you think about it was the logical progression. Once I started working in corrections, I was not there because I was thinking about the future. I stayed because every day was, an, was just endlessly interesting and challenging and a unique learning experience. There was no textbook or curriculum for what I was doing that prepared me for it. It was continuing edu education from day one. It was just fly by the seat of your pants and learn on the fly. And if there's no body of knowledge to guide you, you invented it for yourself and for others. Truthfully, it was about 15 years into my career then I knew I wanted to be a warden. It took me another 10 years to accomplish that goal. But it was a strong goal, and it, I felt it in my heart and soul. It drove me. I knew this what, was what I wanted to do. And I really hope that for you sitting out there so young that someday you have that experience that you know what you want to do and you work towards it and it, it fulfills you. Some people said a woman could never be warden. But I said, I can do that because I was not the type of person that wouldn't take on a challenge or would not try to break barriers. Right now, there are four women wardens in New Jersey. So the times have changed. In corrections, the pendulum swings back and forth in terms of social movements, political movements, government funding. It's constantly evolving, and its mission is always changing. The pendulum swings right and left, and I mean right and left politically to a degree. These ideological swings are driven by politics, social movements. Politics drive government, and governments have the money. Governments fund what we do in corrections. So the pendulum has swung back and forth quite a few times since I have been in corrections. I started in a very liberal era, era where Rehabilitation was the focus. The pendulum swung in the late 80s to a get tough on crime and the war on drugs, mass incarceration, um, lock them up and throw away the key mentality. Uh, then it began to swing back again, rehabilitation, re-entry. A lot of this has to do with the focus on drugs that we are experiencing now. Um, drug addiction, which is one of the major things we deal with in corrections. The population that comes into our jails that are addicted to drugs, that commit crimes, that are a danger to the community because of their addiction to drugs. So we, we have a responsibility to treat them. But part of what research does is help you look at what works in treatment of those populations. The focus when I started was also on inmate rights. It's still on inmate rights. It's never really gotten away from that too much. Yes, inmates have rights. They have most of the same constitutional rights that you have, even though they are locked up. 
They have freedom of religion, access to the courts, freedom of speech, due process, and the right to be free of cruel and unusual punishment. And corrections, it's a misnomer. It's not really about correcting people by punishment. I think people think that that implies punishment. We're not about punishment. That changed in the late 1800s. The courts punish people for their crimes, the crimes that they commit against society. They punish them by giving them a certain amount of time. So the punishment is the time that they are incarcerated. Incarceration should not go above and beyond the time. There should not be, the inmate should not be subject to cruel and unusual conditions of confinement. And part of the reason that we focus on this is because Inmates sue, they win lawsuits, and lawsuits are very, very expensive for county government, particularly county government. The mission of corrections is to improve public safety by ensuring a safe and humane environment for the inmates in our custody and to prepare individuals for reintegra reintegration into our communities. We also have a responsibility to provide a safe environment for our staff. We have a responsibility to public safety. We have a responsibility to the, to the taxpayers. I'm a taxpayer. It's important to me that the money I get in my budget to run my jail, that I use that money effectively and efficiently. Part of our mission is to provide professional training so that our staff is able, able to perform their jobs effectively. This is why they're not called guards anymore. Correction officers would be highly insulted and are highly insulted when they're referred to as guards. They're corrections officer, they go through a lot of professional training and certifications to get their job. So I started as an inmate counselor and had the task of developing inmate rehabilitation programs, religious programs, educational programs, and applying for, for grant money because it takes money to provide all those programs. And I knew I could do it. I'd never done it before, but I could meet that challenge. It wasn't easy, and the jail was not very happy to have me. I was viewed as a political spy. Just so you know, there were, there were guards. They called them guards at that, that time, and there was me, a female, and a civilian, the first one. I was viewed, viewed as a spy from the freeholders and a bleeding heart liberal. I experienced flat-out hostility, resistance, and sabotage. They tried to scare me into quitting. Sometimes they wouldn't let me in the jail. Sometimes they let me in the jail and they locked me in a control room. But the control rooms had windows so I could see what was going on. But I had found my niche and I wasn't bulging and eventually most of them came around. Some of the guards before they were called correction officers were as bad as the inmates at that time. Once a guard locked me in a room with one of our worst female inmates who was very combative. Her name was Clara. She weighed about 90 pounds, soaking wet. I was pretty scared, but I didn't let it show. We both knew it was even Steven physically. And we ended up talking. We talked and we talked, and I learned a lot about Clara, and she learned a lot about me. She was the same age as I was. She had five children. She was a junkie. She was an alcoholic. She was a prostitute. She was HIV positive. She came in and out of our jail. I cannot say that we became friends, but Clara was in and out of jail, and every time she would come to the jail, she would start screaming my name until I saw her, and I would talk her down. And she was one of the biggest re lessons that I learned when it came to jailing. But for the grace of God, go I. Had I been born into the circumstances that Clara was born into, would I have fared any different? Clara eventually died of AIDS. She was found dead in a dumpster in Lakewood. I went to her funeral. Her adult children still come to my jail. Her grandchildren come to my jail. The cycle of crimes and families and poverty and drug, drug addiction is insidious. I have so many jails and jail stories. I don't tell them to entertain. I tell them to make a point and to share my experience. Clara, Alex, T-Love, 
Well, actually, I never tell tea love stories. I was also tasked with developing operational policy and procedures for our jail. And this may have been the biggest learning experience of my life um, because it was not something I had ever done at all. But I could write and I could do research. And I would take any job that they threw at me. It took me two years, but I developed this, the policies and procedures for our jail. Our j policies and procedures are based on case law, litigation, best practices, and are very particular in detail about what it is you do in just about every situation. Nothing you do in corrections is not defined somewhere in some code or some litigation. But I said, I can do that. And it was very important in my career because knowledge is power. And I pretty much had most of the knowledge at that point. There's always something new in corrections. It's always evolving. There's something new every day that has to be done or dealt with, build a new jail, the AIDS epidemic, install cameras and digital video recording devices, which was important because we did that in the 2005, we put digital video record recorders in our jail. And up until that time, whatever happened in a jail happened behind closed doors. It was the inmate's word against the staff's word. And it can be a pretty violent environment. So cameras were very, very important. And my staff was very, very worried the cameras would hurt them, that they would get in trouble because of the cameras. And actually what the cameras did and the recordings of staff inmate behavior and interaction was to protect our officers. And I think they came to know that, that the cameras protected them and showed that they did their job right. So there was always something to do, plan for bail reform, get accredited, run training academies for corrections officers. And the pen pendulum would swing back and forth, and the focus would swing back and forth, and the money would be there, or it would dry up. The door slammed shut on rehabil re rehabilitation in the 1980s because a social scientist somewhere wrote a paper about rehabilitation in the federal system. And his conclusion pretty much was that nothing works. So the dollars dried up, and money was focused onto building new jails and mass incarceration, but the money was not there for treatment for a long time. But incarceration has become so expensive, so burdensome on government at all levels, particularly the county level. I think probably all of you have heard that it costs more to house an inmate in a correctional setting than it does to send an inmate to an Ivy League school. There's just something wrong with that picture. We should have better outcomes. So some new trends that are changing things that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis now. I mentioned the drug epidemic that has resulted in a new focus on treatment and reentry of individuals into the community as safe, law-abiding citizens. That's our goal. It's not easy to accomplish. Drugs are insidious also. Um, but drug treatment is a critical part of what we do in corrections now. Bail reform, that was the last big movement perhaps one of the biggest movements, not the biggest change in my career. Uh, January 1st, 2017, New Jersey bail reform and the Speedy Trial Act began. New Jersey no longer has a bail system. It's a risk-based risk -based system that determines whether you will be incarcerated or not. And the system determines, does a risk assessment that determines your likelihood to show up for court and your risk to commit a crime. So people no longer stay in jail for long periods of time with a $200 bail for a nonviolent crime. The populations in New Jersey County jails have gone down about 20% since the inception of the Bail Reform Act. I think we can all agree that somebody who's not a danger to the community should not sit in the jail, in a jail anywhere, for $200 that they can't pay. They should be out there working and supporting their families, not use, losing their jobs. So it's a, the philosophical framework behind the Bail Reform Act is a good one. It needs some work. They need to balance the risk assessment and public safety. Sometimes people get out, they commit crimes, they hurt people. So there is work to be done. But I think it's a step in the right directions. 
Nowadays, being a, a warden is like being a CEO of a big company. We have the responsibility of managing huge budgets. My budget's almost $30 million. I have 240 employees. I have unions, union contracts, big medical and healthcare contracts, multi-million dollar co contracts. Um, we have to stay ahead of the curve, predict trends. Things change quickly. You have to know what's going on out there and be ready for it when it comes at you. Our governing bodies put a huge trust in us when they appoint us as wardens to run a county jail. Being a warden to me means, in a lot of ways, you have the knowledge, you have the skill set, but you have to have the guts to take on the job. Um, it's a big responsibility, and the public and the government puts their trust in you to do it. Some days it's all about guts because you just don't know what's going to happen and what you're going to have to face, and you just have to be able to hold your head up and walk into the jail every day. Everything I studied is, at Stockton was important to where I ended up. So I could go on and on talking about corrections, and if anybody has any questions, I would love to take them now. Actually, I just wanted to say thank you for sharing your experience. I actually interned at the Ocean County Jail about two or three summers ago. So to hear about the 70s and kind of the reform that they did with the clean air, windows, the library, those are all things that I actually saw within the Ocean County Jail. I actually worked in the library and everything, bringing books to the um, social services department to be given to the inmates. So it's really interesting to hear about your pendulum stance about leaning back and forth between rehabilitation and kind of just closing the door and throwing away the key. Because even three summers ago, I would sit in meetings with um, the mental health department and the correction officers debating on a certain inmate and whether they should be thrown into the greater populace of the jail rather than isolation due to threats of suicide. And you could see how even today, sometimes those departments clash on whether or not to take care of them for their mental health issues or to really just put them where they belong, according to them. So I don't have a question. I just wanted to say thank you for sharing your experience. Um, I was just wondering what other um, mental health professionals and health science professionals work in the prison, because that's definitely not a um, job opportunity we hear about a lot. OK. so. Um Mental health is a big part of what we do. And in Ocean County, we're very fortunate that we have um, an excellent mental health department. We have a psychiatrist, not a full-time psychiatrist. We have full-time psychologist. We have psychiatric social workers and social workers. So there are lots of opportunities in corrections in the mental health field. Um, working within the jail system so far, um, with all this experience that you have, um, I would like your opinion on what do you think, if you have a, how much of your population has mental health issues within your jail system? And do you think that they should be segregated from the rest of the population because of their mental health issues? We have about 20% of our population that have mental health issues. Um, they do get treatment in the jail. In the jail, that when they first come in, they frequently have to be stabilized medically. Um, people are not compliant, that population, when they are not incarcerated or institutionalized, they have a tendency to not comply with medication or appointments that they have. This may have a lot to do with insurance. Um, so they come to the jail, they're treated. We have a mental health unit. The mental health unit is really for the most part for people that need continual observation. It's a reg regular housing unit, um, but it's right there with the mental health staff. They actually, their office, there's a big window that looks into our mental health unit. So mental health treatment is very important and it is about 20% of our population. And you know, that that's statistically, and I myself think that it's higher. I think that we 
deal a lot with the duly diagnosed mental health population and drug addicted population. So it is hard to factor out exactly what it is, but that's a good ballpark figure. So there are jobs, there are careers in corrections, and I can tell you it's very rewarding. Right. Um, if, if, if you have a population, a set population, my question to you was, do you think it should be segregated? We don't segregate people once they're stabilized. Um, right. Unless they have serious problems, and then we'll keep them in our mental health unit. But if they are stabilized and their behavior is okay, we put them in regular population. Uh, some of that has to do with their mental health issues, but also why are they there? What is the, what kind, do they have a violent crime? We have a very um, complex objective jail classification system that determines who gets housed where, who gets housed with what are other group of people. Um, it's very complicated, it's very complex because, I mean, we're dealing with mental health populations, um, we're dealing with gangs, we're dealing with violent people. So for the most part, if somebody has mental health issues and they're stabilized and they don't have a violent crime and they're not likely to act out violently, they can be in general population. So we try to do that as much as we can. All right. Other questions? Recently, I saw an article about the privatization of jails. I'm wondering if you might have comments about that. Uh, generally, the bottom line um, seems to lead to a deterioration in care, and, and I wonder what your thoughts are. Well, I agree with you on that. Um, I'm not a proponent of privatization of the incarceration aspect of jails. Um, we have privatized our medical, our food service. I have a multi-million dollar contract with a healthcare company, CFG. Most of the county jails do have healthcare contracts with private companies to come in and provide that service. It's very effective. It's very cost efficient. Um, you know, you're, when you provide it yourself, you know, your liability is different and also um, it's more expensive because they're county employees and the benefit package is phenomenal. So um, I'm all for privatization of subsets of corrections. The incarceration part, the building, and the monitoring, taking care of the security of inmates, I'm not for privatizing that for the reason that you mentioned. Um, they, there is a decrease in safety, and I think the research shows that over time, uh, the cost may come down for governments, initially, but then they creep back up over time because the contracts that they have with private corrections frequently are based on a number. And that number is what the government pays regardless of whether you have that many people or not. So it ends up being not cost effective and it ends up, um, you end up with staff who are paid frequently almost a minimum wage and they don't have the training that our staff have. Correctional staff in New Jersey are very well trained. They're professionals. They know how to handle people. They know what they're doing. It's a hard job and you have to train people well and I don't see that um, that has played out that way across the country in private corrections. You see it more in the south than you do in the northeast. So I'm not a proponent of privatization of the whole shebang. Warden, 40 years ago you may have been sitting here in this room, even though this room probably wasn't here, you know, and these younger kids here today, you're a role model for these young people in this room today. It proves that anybody in the psychology program from Stockton College can be up there one day giving the same speech to another group of young individuals one day. Today's generation, they deal with a lot of bullying, and in your speech, you seem like you were kind of bullied in the Department of Corrections going through your career as a woman in a predominantly male career. What advice do you have for these younger generation today, even dealing with the presentation before you with the suicide risk of a lot of the younger generation today that can't handle the pressures of what is out there, what's not out there? 
What advice can you give these young people here today from the days you were here at Stockton College where you didn't know what you wanted to be or what career you were going to take from the bottom, going all the way up the top as a warden of a county jail? What, what advice can you give them in reference to not quitting, following their dreams, and keep moving forward? Good question, Eugene. Um, and it is amazing to me to be here today and be considered a role model because you know, I was where you were one day, and all I can say to you is what I said before, you have to look for what stirs your passions, um, what engages your mind, what fulfills you. It's a different time today. You're under a lot more pressures, a lot of different pressures, a lot of different forces than I was in a lot of ways. So you have to keep studying. You have to build strong support groups. You have to be aware of what's going on and stay focused. You know, it's like I said, when I was 17, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, I, I was a late bloomer. Being 17, 18, going to college and getting it right the first time really gives you an advantage. So, you know, you could get where I am a lot sooner, perhaps, but you have to stay focused. Uh, it's very important to study, to do it with commitment, and really apply yourself uh, you know, it's very easy to have fun and be lazy and not really, not really put your energies where they should be to get ahead. Uh, we all go through that. Everybody goes through that with college. But I think it's important that you, you stay focused. Um, and I know it's not easy, so I, I wish you the best of luck doing that. My wish for all of you here today is that you're able to realize your career goals, be successful and be fulfilled as I've been lucky enough to be. You might not end up where you thought you would be, but you may end up where you were meant to be. Always be aware of what stirs your passion, stimulates your mind. Pay attention to those events and follow them when you can. Because like I said, everything is very serendipitous. Everything is circumstances beyond your control. So you need to see what's out there and feel it and follow, follow dreams, follow what makes you happy. I would like to thank Warden Eugene Caldwell, who's here today. Warden Caldwell is also president of the New Jersey County Jail Wardens Association. I would like to thank you for nominating me for this award. Um, the New Jersey County Jail Wardens Association is the best, the best support group anybody could ever have. I have 21 wardens that are my friends and we work together closely and we support each other because it's a tough job and if you're not a warden, you, you just really don't understand it, I don't think. Um, it's real fast paced, crisis management, fly by the seat of your pants, multitasking every day. Um, it's about life and safety, so that, that's a big responsibility. But I can't think of anything I'd rather be doing, and I feel so lucky that I get to do it. I'd also like to thank my family, who's put up with this career. Um, I would like to thank my daughter, Melanie. She's here today and was with me as a small child on this campus and went to Free to Be, and when Free to Be wasn't available, frequently went to me, with me to my classes. Um, so she was here with me through this whole journey. I know you have fond memories of this life we had here. Melanie is incredibly successful in her own right, and I am very proud of her. And Melanie, someday I promise I'm going to stay home and be a good grandmother <laughs> one of these days. It's one of the things that I feel like my career has done. It, it's, it's taken time from my family. I always have to be available. I have to be available for any kind of response. I'm always on the phone. So um, I have two grandchildren now, and I would love to be able to spend more time with them. So it's coming soon. So thank you again. Thank all of you for this honor. It was great to be here today.